We co-evolved with the natural world. We're not meant to be isolated with just people and especially away from, you know, the wind and the sun and the trees and the grass and soil. So disconnection is built into the industrialized colonizing nations. And that is part of the problem, right? The big problem. Because then we don't, you know, nature's just a bunch of dead object and objects and we're so cool, we can do anything because we're superior. That's all left brain stuff. So the left brain has taken over the Western world. Welcome to Entangled World, where we explore our interrelated existential, social, economic, ecological, and technological challenges their underlying drivers, and how a more beautiful world might emerge. I'm your host, Najia Shawkat Lepsen. I'm a daughter of Pakistani Muslim immigrants, a mom, and an inter-systems thinker. Join me on a journey to discover what is uniquely and meaningfully ours to do at this pivotal moment in time in service to the sacredness of life. Quick note before we get started, if you haven't already listened to the first full episode of this podcast called What is the Meta Crisis? I highly recommend you go back and listen to that first. It's really a foundational episode that provides a lot of the grounding that is important for all the episodes that follow. My guest today is Darsha Narvez. Darsha is Professor Emerita of Psychology at the University of Notre Dame. Born in Minnesota, she grew up living around the world as a bilingual, bicultural, Puerto Rican, German American, but calls Earth her home. Her earlier careers include professional musician, business owner, music teacher, Spanish teacher, and seminarian, among many other endeavors. Darsha uses an interdisciplinary approach to studying evolved morality, child development, and human flourishing. Her most recent books include Restoring the Kinship Worldview and The Evolved Nest, Nature's Way of Raising Children and Creating Connected Communities, both of which I've read and would highly recommend. Darsha explores how compassionate morality in humans unfolds and what we can do to nurture it. In our conversation, we talk about how early life experiences are so critical because they shape and mold our personality, our desires and values, and our capacities. Darsha says when you undermine early experience, you're setting up the brain to be a dominator brain because you don't develop all the social skills that naturally emerge from an immersed and nested experience early in life. Darsha and I talk about how in our modern society, many of us are living in ways that are very disconnected from the earth and that this disconnection actually starts at birth. We actually evolved for cooperative child raising with kin and non-kin, meaning animals, plants, other living matter, all actively participating in raising our children not just one or two parents, as is the case in many industrialized nations. And if you think about it, there's no society unless you're taking care of mothers and children. Imagine if we created a society around caring for mothers and children. What might that world look like? How might we act today to support the emergence of that world? Each one of us has a gift to give the world. And in this episode, Darsha and I invite you to consider what your unique gift might be, and how you might share it with the world. I think this episode will resonate, particularly if you're a parent who feels like you're just struggling day to day and trying to keep your head underwater, underwater, above water. Human history tells us we've actually evolved to live a very different way than many of us who are caught in the web of living modern lifestyles. I invite you to listen to this episode with an open mind and an open heart. I hope you enjoy the episode. If you do, please subscribe or follow on your favorite podcast app or subscribe to the Entangled World Pod YouTube channel. Darsha, thank you so much for joining me today on the Entangled World Podcast. I'm really excited to talk with you. You are a world leader on human development, and what I think is so unique about your work is that 
you connect childhood rearing to the indigenous worldview. And your work offers what I think is really profound guidance for parents and new parents to be. So to begin, one of the things I usually like to do is just to ask guests to kind of share their story and how they came to do the work that they're doing. All right. Well, it's great to be with you, Nadia. It's, uh, uh, I always enjoy talking to people who have such interesting podcasts about really important topics. So, uh, well, my I've had a lot of careers, and it took me a while to get to the kind of focus of my heart from a young age, which was justice for children. I spent half my childhood outside of the United States every year for a year, every third year of my life, and I was coming back to Minnesota in between and just could not understand why children my age in so-called third world countries were standing on street corners selling gum in rags barefoot, and I'm so privileged, and then to come back to the States and see all the materialism and actually wastefulness. So I, uh, it, I used to cry for those kids. And I, um, it just took me a while because I have a lot of interests. I went to seminary because I'm trying to find where's the reason, why is the world crazy like this? And I uh, had my own business that I started, and I was a classroom uh, music teacher, and then later a classroom Spanish teacher, and then worked in the Hispanic community. Finally, though, I found the field of moral development and thought, oh, this is it. This is going to help me explain it, you know, why people are so different in their orientation to morality, to justice, to ethics. And when I got my PhD at the University of Minnesota, the focus was uh, on, you know, reasoning and thinking. That's the Western way of thinking about what's good about human beings and what's different about them. It's, you know, you reason well, and then you, you uh, apply that reason to your actions, and then you're a good person because you had good intention. It doesn't matter what happens, but you had good intentions. <laughs> and for me, I grew up uh, in a harsh household. And my brain, under stress, would just freeze, and I couldn't speak. Uh, you know, like in speech class, an impromptu speech, I was given the topic, the mop. I said one thing. This is ninth grade. I said one thing about a mop, clean the floor with it, and then couldn't think of anything else and just turned multiple colors for five minutes. Uh, bad teaching there, right? The teacher should have intervened with help. But anyway, so, but that followed me uh, for years uh, in seminary. I couldn't speak up when the professor said, oh, I loved your paper. Talk, tell, tell us about it. Uh, so that means that the Western view that you think well and then you apply your, your reasoning to action doesn't work if you're free, you have a frozen brain, right? It, there's something else going on. So I had to examine the neurobiology of what leads to our actions, of our ability to act. And it turns out that uh, when our, the stress response kicks in, there's various ways it displays itself. Frozen brain is one way. You can't think very well. Your blood flow is shifted. So I'm going into the freeze state. But in an earlier kind of level, you'd be ready to run away, fight or flight. Uh, and you're, all that blood flow is shifting from your brain to your muscles to help you run. Or fight, right? So you're not going to be open-hearted, open-minded. You're not going to be, have a compassionate morality. And that's my focus. How do we get back to human beings with compassionate morality? Because right now we've created all these people from the early undercare, which is the lack of the evolved nest, which I focus on, that shifts the brain development towards stress response, to be stress reactive. And then you've got these adults who go get triggered easily, and then they can't be compassionate. They're not open-hearted. They don't, they're moving dif uh, to a different part of their brain, a different mindset that disallows them from realizing that they can be flexibly attuned and actually cooperate and figure out things together. Anyway, so that's my story. What went wrong with humanity and how to fix it? I'd love to just kind of dig in a little bit more to what you said about living in many different places and some of the that you learned through those experiences? 
Well, it was. Uh, it made me a third culture kid. A third culture kid is one that doesn't quite fit into at least two cultures, right? So the U.S. culture and the Latin culture, Hispanic culture, where we lived in Spanish-speaking countries. So I never felt like I fit anywhere, um, which is not great for a kid, but it's great for an adult. You learn from all those experiences and you have a lot of different um, awarenesses and practical knowledge that people who just get uh, stay in one place don't have. So it was a challenge to come back to the States and have all these experiences that I, my the, the same group of friends uh, in Minnesota would evolve and have their um, <clears throat> interests, but they weren't very much interested in, in the international view or the bigger picture stuff because not many people traveled in those days. And so I you know, had to shut down that part of myself. And I couldn't quite fit into the very materialistic uh, way of being the United States. So I was on the edge. I'm an edge walker. I want to zoom out for for a minute before we um, dive back in. So, you know, um, on this podcast, we talk a lot about the meta crisis or the entangled and interrelated set global crises that we're facing that have underlying generative dynamics. And I'd love to hear your perspective on how you understand the global crises that we're facing and why we've sort of found ourselves in the situation that we're in. Well, we forgot our ancestral wisdom and our our ancestors who knew how to live well uh, within and with nature are industrialized and then colonization and globalization system has just undermined the way we raise children. And that's so important. Uh, early life experience is so important, and that's the evolved nest, um, because so many systems in the body and the social capacities are shaped at that time that are you know, set for lifelong living. And uh, we, in the industrialized world, kind of, yeah, children, I'll, we've decided now, a lot of people think it's all genetic. Uh, you know, if a children's one or another, it's just genes. There's nothing you can do about it. As if, you know, they're not really shaping and molding the personality and the desires and values and capacities of that child, which early life experience does. <clears throat> so we have now created all sorts of people who are triggered easily into bracing against one another instead of being that flexible, uh, interpersonal um, kind of dancing that our ancestors could do easily with strangers. They were welcoming. The uh, first contact diaries of the explorers and others show that the native peoples around the world were very welcoming to the, oh, oh come on in here, I'm very hospitable, until they learned their <laughs> desires to control them and rob them and kill them and all that stuff that Columbus and others have done to the native peoples. So we forgot how to live well with the earth We've been around for uh, two million years, uh, depending on how you count it, or if you want to say just Homo sapiens sapiens, three hundred thousand years. And in uh, ninety-five to ninety-nine percent of the of our history, uh, depending on which um, number or how far back you go, we have lived in nomadic bands, small band hunter gatherers, where it's egalitarianism. It's everyone gets their basic needs met. You don't have any possessions to fight over. And you're just living with the earth in a responsible, egalitarian way as a partner to the natural world instead of a dominator. And when you undermine early experience, you are setting up the brain to be a dominator brain because you don't develop all the social skills that are supposed to be developing from immersed, nested experience. And you end up with people, especially boys, because boys are, are, have less built-in resilience and take longer to mature, and so they need more of the evolved nest, and we give them less in industrialized uh, kind of toxic masculinity <laughs> societies, and uh, you end up then they have no capacity other than the one up, one down. You're either a winner or you're a loser, you know, and they spend their life 
trying to win and they never really feel right because they've got the big hole in the heart from not getting their needs met early on. Yeah. And I think that's so it's such an important point, what you mentioned about how 95 to 90 percent of our history, we've lived in a very different way, because I think so often we, especially those of us who perhaps haven't studied the history as in depth, think that this is sort of the way that things have always been and that it's, you know, it's really difficult to change our current ways of life because we're so ingrained in them. When we zoom out, and look at the span of history, you realize this last 100, 150 years of the ways that we've been living, particularly since the Industrial Revolution, is such a tiny time span of our life as humans. And that uh, many of the challenges that we're seeing now, whether it's from um, a mental health perspective or uh, physical health challenges that result from destroying our food systems and our, and our, uh, and our biosphere, are, are partly related to this, this disconnected way of living. And uh, the disconnection starts from birth, if not before, because we uh, traumatize the young. Uh, our fetuses, if the mother is not feeling supported, uh, if she's all stressed, that's actually shaping a very stress-reactive brain in the, in the fetus. And then birth is traumatizing in medicalized birth. Uh, the comparisons to home birth children is just amazing uh, what the differences are. And so you've, you build in disconnection right away from the, in the child when you separate them from mother. You make them sleep alone. You make them cry themselves to sleep. You have now established disconnection as the basic form of their personality. <clears throat> and so you end up disconnected from yourself. You don't trust your intuitions as a baby because nobody listened to them. And it's like, oh, okay, let's stuff those down. <laughs> and then you don't distrust the, you distrust the relationships because they didn't listen to you and they're very inconsistent and predictable. And then you distrust the world generally because you never really connected. You didn't attach to the natural world. You don't, and you're inside four walls. You're raised inside four walls with screens now. And you don't ever build those relational attunement capacities with the natural world, which is also our heritage. We co-evolved with the natural world. We're not meant to be isolated with just people and especially away from, you know, the wind and the sun and the trees and the grass and soil. So disconnection is built into the industrialized colonizing nations and that is part of the problem, right? The big problem. Because then we don't, you know, nature's just a bunch of dead object and objects. And we're so cool, we can do anything because we're superior. That's all left brain stuff. So the left brain has taken over the Western world. And now it's spread all over the world because of the British Empire with its schools that they left everywhere when they, <laughs> when they closed down their uh, colonizing. They left the schools so that they would build the same kind of mindset in the elite. So we have that all over the world. The elites think like Westerners, um, that they're, you know, superior to the natural world, divorced from the natural world, separate and uh, controlling, and humans can take care of it all. We don't need nature. And, I mean, the stories go on about what we don't need. Women, we don't need, you know, those non-white people, and <laughs> on and on. The Western world has really done a lot of damage. And the way you're speaking of disconnection and, and trauma reminds me of, uh, of the early days of when my son was born. So we, we had uh, a lot of challenges at, at during the birth, and so there was there was a lot of trauma there. And uh, he was born with a cleft lip and a cleft palate, and so multiple surgeries. But the thing uh, that comes to my mind when you were speaking is he was. He was colicky when he was a baby, and the only thing that really calmed him down was being outside. And so walking with him outside, um, we had this little screened-in porch in our backyard, and sitting with him outside, he that would often be the only place he would actually fall asleep was, was outside, where he could hear the birds chirping and feel the wind. And so, yeah, so I think as a mother, that, that resonates deeply with me. Yeah, and that's that's our heritage is to be born and immediately be surrounded by the natural world, not to be 
you know, in a room with uh, all the microbes invading your body and the first smell you have is alcohol and the first taste or, or is sugar water, which hospitals give to babies to keep them calm. And uh, the first t uh, touch is a rough blanket. I mean, this is crazy. Uh, we should be out in the world when we have our birth uh, and be surrounded by those, the songbird songs and the smell of the of the pine forest or whatever, uh, and the sounds of the creek and, and all that, because we're ready to learn that. Our brains are ready to, they're massive uh, learning machines, so to speak, in early life. And whatever those first imprints are, really matter. I want to talk a bit about your two books, uh, one that you, both of which I have here, which I love, um, Restoring the Kinship Worldview, which you co uh, with Four Arrows, and then, of course, The Evolved Nest, your most recent book. Um, and so I want to dig into a little bit of your first book, because I read that uh, maybe about a year and a half ago or so, and just found it to be so packed with so much wisdom. Um, and so I want to spend a little bit of time unpacking some of, some of what's in there. And in In Restoring the Kinship Worldview, you talk about how most indigenous cultures were, were matriarch, that the characteristics of matriarchies around the world included things like gift economies and egalitarian consensus and sacred cultures of the feminine divine. Can you talk a bit more about this and what implications it has for how our current civilization needs to evolve if we're going to make it through the meta crisis. Yeah, so the matriarchal orientation of just being focused on mothers and children is, uh, or again, 99%, uh, because there's no society unless you're taking care of mothers and children. And it's just a natural way to evolve and to thrive and, and so on. Um, the radical anthropologists say that in our prehistory, in this these times, the 99% in the egalitarian bands, that women really were in charge of the sexuality in the community, and they would insist on getting the men to go get meat um, in order to have then at full moon a sexual orgy or whatever relations. And they needed the meat in order, because the brains that we have need a whole lot of calories to grow well uh, and uh, to build our big social brain. So we evolved differently from chimpanzees. Chimpanzees have a singular mother, and the uh, mother guards the infant because there's infanticide uh, by males who are not the father, for example. But we evolved uh, for cooperative child raising with kin and non-kin growing the, the young and not caring who the father is so much. And in this, these capacities then of the social brain that grew include mind reading, and sharing, and being generous with one another. That's part of our heritage as our normal um, personality, as uh, our normal human nature. And when we undercare for young children, the lack of the evolved nest, you're actually raising it more of a chimpanzee, <laughs> one that's more self-centered and dominance-oriented. That's not mm -hmm. our heritage. Our heritage is to be egalitarian, but you need the cooperative child raising. You need the evolved nest to do that. And matriarchal societies are fiercely also egalitarian. They don't allow domination in our um small band hunter-gatherers who have been observed and documented, they actually will beat down or tease down a big ego. So if a hunter gets a big animal, the other hunters there will say, oh, well, it's so small, we should go back and get a, a rabbit would be bigger and make all these remarks until the hunter laughs and laughs, you know, and they all joke around. And when they're asked, why do you do that? Well, if we didn't do that, he would become dangerous. So they knew that the inflated ego leads to a sense of entitlement. And we have all sorts of evidence now in psychology showing that people with more wealth, even in experimental lab situations where they're artificially given an advantage over the 
uh, partner in the experiment, they start to get less sensitive to others. They, they start to have less empathy. They think they deserve more. It's, so our ancestors and our cousins who still do this knew that that was so important for uh, guarding against dangerousness of hierarchy. And we have now over what, how, how many generations have encouraged these big egos? <laughs> Uh, and we now live the results of that, where we have a small number of people in the world who are, you know, just greedily taking more and more and more and wanting to hoard it for themselves, you know, from that deep insecurity, from unnestedness, and from allowing them to let their egos grow. Uh, and so it's killing us, killing the planet, killing uh us in so many ways, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the global warming and climate instability, toxics everywhere and everything, soil, air, water, food, our bodies, mass extinction, and ozone depletion, and all sorts. Of, those are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Pandemics, probably we could add. It's all coming from this lack of, of controlling the big ego and the undermining of our, our compassionate human nature. I think this is so fascinating because this is something that we as a culture have really lost, right? We don't have, especially in Western cultures, we don't have these practices anymore of keeping egos in check. And in fact, we we often do the opposite. We we as parents, we're like trying to figure out how to give our kid the best advantage and, you know, uh, pr praising them constantly. Nothing wrong with praise, but the sort of intention behind a lot of that to me feels like this race, that we're all part of this race. And as a parent, you, to be a good parent, you have to make sure that your kid is like leading the pack in the race. And so this this shift in worldview, the simple shift seems to me to be at the root of so much of what of what we're experiencing, yeah, I think is, and it and it's rooted again in the lack of early care that's nested or evolved nest, because when you don't provide that nest, you are undermining the confidence of that child. A baby is ready to crawl up the mother's belly at birth and and stimulate the nipple to to release the milk, uh, which is like wow, talk about empowering. Right? And then the baby is supposed to be able to, at will, have breast milk when they're ready, which is going to be every few minutes when they're very young. Uh, and so they're intended to be carried. Our milk is thin, and that's why uh, it should be ingested frequently with uh, tons of hormones. It's 80% alive. And, and so the baby needs to feel like they're in charge. Uh, because they're like fetuses for the first 18 months, fetuses of other animals, because their brain plates don't close till around 18 months. And so it's like they have a lot of growing to do. So rapidly, every few seconds, millions of synapses of, of um, brain connections are growing, attaching from experience. And so they need to feel like they are uh, matter. And how they matter is when you provide what they need and let them be in charge for those first few years. And then they'll be so cooperative after that. Whereas the industrialized culture is like, oh, no, you got to control that baby or you'll spoil them. And then they'll, you know, <laughs> what does spoiling mean? It means that they're going to rely on you and trust you. And when you then don't spoil the baby, you're detaching mother and child. You're putting them in that state of disconnection again, of deep insecurity. And when they're in deep insecurity for the rest of their life, they're easy to control. You can, you know, snap them into being obedient or, you know, snap them into triggering and then you shape what they're triggered about, you know, with some ideology or some story, some cultural narrative. And then you got control. It's very Nazi-esque. Nazis knew this. <laughs> they knew you break the child's spirit before age three and you got their control forever. So that's fascinating. So do you think our practices our, our sort of Western practices of the disconnected nest early on came from a certain group of people who were intentionally trying 
to do this for for reasons of control or do you think they sort of organically evolved and it's just the situation we found ourselves in but you're making a really strong case for why that needs to shift i think it's both so when when civilization came about about 10,000 years ago depending on how you count it and all that uh you started to decrease uh the support for young children because the parents had to be in the field you get into monocultural agriculture and everyone gets busy you have to work all the time unlike when you're a nomadic forager and so you leave the child behind so you decrease breastfeeding you de decrease touch you decrease responsiveness and then the brain starts to shift right and starts to get less secure but then uh religion uh christianity roman christianity came in and the idea of original sin, that babies are born sinful, you know, and Augustine, St. Augustine, in his, I think his confessions, he writes about himself as a baby, is wanting his mother's breast milk. It's like, oh, look at that sinful baby. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, and then- So ridiculous. Yeah, so he, they, the lack of understanding of child development, and then to pin any f desire of that young child for getting their needs met, because they're, they're expecting that to be like a womb. They expect an external womb experience for those first 18 months, two years, so that their needs are met while they're growing. They, they have an inner compass guiding them. You know, you need to let, follow that compass, because they know what, what's good for them, unless you've ruined them somehow. But, um, and so... <laughs> The church then decided, yeah, because of all these patriarchs, males, uh, they chose, Constantine chose the male version of Christianity. There were many forms. There were women in charge of many subgroups, but they chose the one that was most like the Jewish, uh, where males are in charge and then males, you know, kind of denigrate femininity. Um, uh, not as extreme as when the Protestant Reformation came in, then femininity was like, ah, oh, none of that. But um, so original sin gets embedded in the, in the religious view of children, and then punishment is good, and that's how they understand the biblical uh, passages. You know, you got to punish your child to be good because they're so evil to begin with, you know. And it's all the opposite, of course. And the Native Americans, when the Jesuits came over, and the Jesuits have these lengthy diaries, and they talk about it, the, the Huron uh, tribe was appalled that they would, punish a child. Um, in this one incident, um, a Huron uh, man came, went over to see what the drumming of the young child, uh, how it was going, and, and the child hit the guy with his mallet. And so the Huron uh, demanded some recompense, because that's what you do when you've offended someone. And in the Huron community, you just give a gift. Well, what the hero, uh, the sorry, the Jesuits did was they stripped down the boy and they were going to beat him. And the the Hurons go, what? You can't do that! And they took off their clothes and you know took the place of a child because they couldn't understand why would you ever do that to a child? Because the understanding is that when you interfere with that inner compass of the child's development, you are now shifting their trajectory toward being a problematic person. You have to honor the child, respect the child. They and many uh, of our ancestral communities, nomadic foragers, and other traditional communities, they talk about its grandfather. Grandfather's spirit is in that child. So you know, you somehow they know which ancestors appeared in that child, and so you you know, call them grandfather. You're not going to spank your grandfather for heaven's sakes, and you know you treat them with respect. So this way of looking at the world, the worldview is much more dynamic and interrelated in time, uh, future, past, and present are all mixed together. And uh, you're just aware of being in the flow of dynamic relationships. And that's something that the industrialized world, and especially in the Western world in the last few centuries of the Enlightenment, it's like, oh, no, it's all static. Everything we can categorize and measure, that's reality. Everything else, nah, ignore that. All right. So it's all... Oh, craziness. It's a shift to the left brain dominance. And that's what happens when you undermine early care. You've undermined the development of the right hemisphere, which is scheduled to grow more rapidly in early life. And the, relation, uh, the right hemisphere is very relationally oriented, aware of dynamism and, and connection and fluidity and empathy. And, and the left brain is just about measuring and categorizing and, you know, some uh, remote abstractions, models that it makes up and 
doesn't have a connection to the real world. That's fascinating. I didn't know that the right brain uh, grows more rapidly in early age. That uh, that makes uh, so much sense to me. And um, it makes me think of Ian McGilchrist's work in The right. Master and His Emissary, where he talks about how our current culture has really made the left brain the master and the right brain the emissary. And it's and it's a flip. What we actually need to do is the exact opposite, because the right brain is able to better perceive the whole and the relationality versus the left brain that tries to categorize everything and break it down into its component parts. And and one of the things he talks about is not that one is better than the other, that they both need to interact together. And there's, it, you know, our society has reaped enormous benefits from having some aspects be very left brain dominated, but that at the core of many of the problems that we're facing is the the sort of left brain hemisphere, the separation of everything into its component parts, and then optimizing one aspect without consideration for impacts on other aspects. So when you think about things like unintended unintended consequences or negative externalities, that's like the left brain, the left hemisphere really doubling down on on trying to make one aspect, you know, more optimized than the other, whereas a right brain hemisphere would, the orientation is more able to sort of say, okay, let's step back and kind of get the, get the big picture. Yeah. Um, so the right hemisphere grows from experience, from immersed whole body experience. And so you need, and it's, should be what's focused on in childhood. So having, you know, running around and playing, lots of plays, part of the evolved nest, but you know, observing and modeling adult behavior, you know, cooking and sweeping up and all that kind of thing. All that is right hemisphere is developing um, kind of a whole mapping of how to act in the world. And if you don't have that whole body experience, you're not getting the maps. You're not getting the intuitions for how to act in the world. And, and so if you're stuck in a crib or playpen or screen as a child, you're not going to have much to go on. And so you're going to then use the left brain. You're going to look for some ideology or some script to follow because the you've enhanced the survival systems. We're born with these survival systems of fear, rage, panic. And when you don't get the evolved nest of, of nurturance, those things get enhanced because you're in stress. You're stressed so much. Then you have to use them to stay alive. And then you go to school and it's the left brain stuff that's encouraged. You know, take this test, learn this information, then you'll be a good person. Um, but you don't have the, all the, the heart-based understanding of how to live your life. You don't know how to physically, you don't have the know-how for relational uh, experiences, for uh, relational consciousness to the natural world is all missing. And so you end up with these people who are half, half human, really. They're robopaths is one term that's been used. Um, and they, uh, you know, uh, are trained up by screens and electronics instead. And they don't have a sense of how the real world works, you know, how long it takes for something to develop or grow and what it needs and how to be nurturing. Uh, and so they treat everyone else that way. So the left brain is something, well, if we call it intellect or thinking, the calculating mind is something that the major religions of the world have said is a very dangerous tool. It's a useful tool to be used once in a while for problem solving, but if you spend too much time there, you start to think that's who you are and you lose yourself. You're not going to be wise because wisdom is about love and connection. It's, it's about understanding how everything is connected. And the left brain doesn't do that. The left brain is only wired to itself. Right hemisphere is wired to all the um, earlier parts of the brain that evolved and to the outside world. It's the negotiator between inner and outer. It just does it typically doesn't have the verbal capacities. And so that's why when the left brain gets overdeveloped and overemphasized, that verbalness can actually, you know, shame that left, that right hemisphere's nuance and, and sensitivities into being shut down in your it, it reminds me of um in your book restoring the kinship worldview there's there's a part where you talk about um 
how physicist D David Boehm expressed what indigenous wisdom understands. And um, I have this here. In your book, you write, the world is one of dynamic unity. Everything is connected and interacting with no separable or static object. Can you unpack this a bit? Because I think it's almost become trendy to say, oh, we're all connected. But this is this is really pointing to something very deep. And so I'm just wondering if you could unpack it a little bit for us. Yeah. So David Baum is expressing the modern physics um, view of, of the universe, essentially, that we are all vibratory matter and that our vibrations are affecting everything around us. The way I, I picture it is that I'm a spider in a web and every action I take, and that means my feelings as thoughts and my behavior are reverberating out on the web to everything else so that if I'm if I'm in a state of anger or a state of fear I'm actually reverberating that out and then others can pick that up and Rupert Sheldrake has this notion of morphic resonance that our previous ancestors leave behind fields of energy of kind of that mold uh, or affect our behavior and our thoughts and we're doing that too. So when we uh, live and, you know, listen to hate talk radio or television uh, or social media, we are now resonating with hate and putting that out in the world. So this is a, you know, it's an interacting uh, world that we are co-constructing. We are creating the world with our imaginations, with our attention, with the way we are behaving in our bodies because we are not, you know, isolated. We're not individuals. We are a whole, a collective. And so the way I understand it is, is that we have ethical responsibilities to make sure that we are in a state that's going to promote and enhance the life of others and not um, degrade it or harm it in any way. And so that's an ongoing responsibility every moment of the day. Am I honoring this uh, life form that I'm meeting right now, this spider, this tree, this person? Am I in a state where I can let love energy flow? Because the energies from the universe are flowing in us. Which ones are we going to embrace? The ones that are fearful and angry or the ones that are loving and connecting? And this is something I think a lot about, particularly with the responsibility of hosting this podcast because I'm putting out those vibrations, right? And one of the things that I think I find challenging is to find ways to talk about these complex topics, many of which are stressful and fear-inducing and difficult to process and to deal with, but trying to do it in a way that hopefully helps people to understand them a bit deeply and be inspired to take action in ways that do contribute towards um, creating the more beautiful world that that we all want. But it's, yeah, it's it's a difficult one, I think, to sort of walk that tightrope. Yeah, because we're pushed into thinking that uh, my identity that I have right now is my only identity. Whereas in our ancestral context, identity is shifting all the time. You're shape-shifting, actually. You take the identity of an animal. You take the identity... In this context, your friends call you this. In that context, they call you that. Uh, and Or you take up a name. And it's much more fluid and, and relaxing and playful than what we allow ourselves today, where, you know, you get very rigid again from the early undercare, where you have to grab onto something to feel secure. You're going to grab onto this identity or this ideology or this worldview. And that's, and don't take that away from me or I'm lost. I'm dead. I'm, you know. It's the abyss, the abyss we're trying not to feel again from being left alone in the crib, being left alone to cry. That abyss we cannot face unless we go to therapy and have some or good friendships where, that help us move through, feel that pain that we had, that primal wound uh, where we, you know, so we aren't running away from it. We realize, oh, I got through that. I'm still here. I'm connected. Wow. And then you can actually be present to others instead of always wandering around with a you know a guardedness a shield you know because you don't want to 
find out what's down there, all that pain. Uh, and you don't want to reveal yourself to others because they're going to tease you and make you feel that awful pain again. So there's a lot of healing that has to be done. And then we can help each other do that by being welcoming and helping others feel like they matter, like they belong. And little by little, the, the, the shield can start to melt away, start to crack and reveal the beauty of each, uni- each individual. Each one of us has a gift to the world. We have to honor it and embrace it and, and welcome it and try to help people get past all the defenses that they've put up uh, and from under care, from being bullied, from being mistreated. And what you're speaking about with respect to rigid identities that many of us often have, it's actually, I've thought about this quite a bit, and it's actually one of the reasons I started writing my name as my, you know, my, my first name, middle name, last name, using all lowercase letters instead of the capital first letter, because my intention in doing that is to sort of share this idea that a name is just a name. It's one aspect of my identity, but it's not, it's not so rigid and it's not like the only thing that I am. Yes. Good. Yeah. And you can take up a new name <laughs> sometimes, yeah. right? <laughs> my, yeah. My husband yeah. and I have lots of different names for each other. We are always playing with names. Yeah. Cute ones. Yeah. And that's actually interesting because I think naturally, I mean, you know, my my five-year-old, I mean, he has, we have like six different nicknames for him. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I think as parents, we sort of naturally do that with our young ones. We yeah. kind of give them lots of different names. Yeah, and having a, a, a boy uh, or a child before age seven, you know, it's just a magical age. They are still connected unless something traumatic has happened. They're still connected to the implicate order, the realm beyond what we can see, the unmanifest. And they're much more uh, receptive to those energies out there. And they'll say what they, you know, they have a lot of wise things to say. And they can be so playful and help the adults uh, grow their right hemisphere because more play yeah. throughout life, your right hemisphere will grow. So I want to talk um, a bit more about your your latest book, The Evolved Nest. So for, for those who don't know, how might, and we've been already talking about this, but I wonder if maybe you can crystallize it a little bit. How might you define the term evolved nest? And what are some of the key practices that are critical to creating an evolved nest, which I think any parents of young children or parents to be would find really interesting. Let me say at the outset that the evolved nest is for all of us. There's just the first two components of the nine that we've identified and studied in my lab. Just the first two will apply to young children only. The rest of them are for all of us to help us maintain our compassionate human natures. So the first that's a great clarification. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So the first one is soothing perinatal experiences, and that's uh, prenatal. So the mother feels supported, welcome, she's relaxed. The baby then is getting positive biochemistry to grow, and the mother is singing to the baby, you know, and and, uh, sperm whales uh, have a unique song, dolphins too, for their babies uh, that they learn in when the baby's still in the womb. Uh, that then they, they know afterwards and can be calmed with that song. This is part of our heritage, too, in, in some of the societies that have been examined that follow the evolved nest. And then birth is, is soothing, so no separation of mom and baby, no painful procedures, no sugar water to mess up the microbiome. Our hospitals in the U.S., most of them violate all this and cause trauma for various reasons. Babies also are forced out of the womb. Uh, based on a doctor's due date, whereas babies vary by how long they stay in the womb by about 55 days. So you can't predict what the due date is for a particular baby. Uh, so we need to follow the, the schedule that the baby has for coming, of course, unless there's emergencies health-wise and such. But And then the mother and baby need to have that, that golden hour or hours at right after birth to bond because in natural conditions... The baby will crawl up uh, the mother's belly, start the uh, massage the nipple, and start the release of milk or colostrum. And the bonding is just amazing. Uh, And their reward systems are ready to hook into one another for life, you know, at a very deep level. 
And when you separate them, that those energies go down and the, it's never the same. They also have all these stress hormones that have been activated for birth and their presence with one another will calm them down. If you separate the baby with all those stress hormones, <clears throat> often they will last for weeks. So in the study uh, they did in the 50s comparing Ugandan uh, home births, Ugandan hospital births with Western and Euro American and European hospital births, all the hospital birth babies, they cry uh, when they're awake for two or three months. They're crying or they're sleeping most of the time. And for the home birth babies in Uganda, day two, they're smiling <laughs> because smiling doesn't happen. The Western doctors tell us, oh, smiling yeah. won't happen until age to two months, three months. Yeah, they say it's gas. <laughs> These babies that are home birthed, had, were smiling, following the mothers, you know, that this ability to follow the mother around the room. Like, what? They're sitting up straight? This doesn't happen in the hospital birth babies till two or three months later. So we have just our baselines for what's normal have shifted, uh, and we put up with all sorts of um, abnormal baselines, species, atypical baselines for birth, for example, for all these things, actually. Breastfeeding is another one. That's number two. Our breast milk is thin, uh, unlike a predator's breast milk, which is thick, uh, so that the mother can leave. The baby doesn't have to drink it as often. Uh, and it, it's just a magic thing, breast milk. Ours is thin, and so it has to be ingested frequently, several times an hour in those newborns, uh, maybe every few minutes, because it's filled with uh, all the hormones and things to build the brain properly. It's 80% alive. It varies by time of day. So in the morning, it gives energizing agents. In the evening, it's calming agents. It's uh, different for boys than for girls, and it develops an antibody for an infectious agent in the region based on the saliva, a baby's saliva. Uh, it gives cues to the breast to develop that. So it's just this unbelievable, uh, wonderful elixir. And our... Uh, average age of weaning for our species should be, and is observed in these communities, nomadic foragers, to be four years, which is like... Four years? Wow. Mind-blowing, right? Yeah. And in one analysis uh, based on biology, six years, because that's when the first, first adult tooth comes in, right? And that's a cognitive shift time. Uh, so uh, now when we say that long, it usually means that you continue night nursing for those years. And night milk has tryptophan, which is a precursor of serotonin, which is related to not getting depressed and being more intelligent. So uh, that's the thing to keep going is the night nursing as much as possible. Of course, once you start to diminish breast uh, feeding, the body thinks you don't need it anymore and starts to decrease its supply. So you have to be careful. So you need uh, lactation consultants to help along here, <laughs> especially at the beginning if you're a new mom. It's hard to learn, actually, to do it. Uh, that's the two that belong only to young uh, children. The rest are for all of us, and they include a welcoming social climate so that we feel like we matter to others, that we belong, that we have something to offer the community. Um, and that's going to keep us also in a good state away from loneliness, for example. Another is affectionate touch and no negative touch. Affectionate touch for a baby is pretty much 24-7 because their vagus nerve is being developed and touch helps breastfeeding too because the vagus nerve has uh, is, uh, moves along this pathway here and uh, is developed then through breast, the suckling action. So actually pacifiers are probably good, but bottles are not. Bottles don't make you do the sucking action that breastfeeding does so it doesn't help um, and so touch uh, needs to be moving touch often for a young baby they expect to have the mom moving around like she's hunting gathering uh, and moving through the natural world so that the baby can uh, breastfeed at will and then also look out at others and the natural world and have a sense of communion with all mm. No negative touch. Negative touch, we have long-term studies now, quite a number of them showing it's detrimental. 
it, it leads to the child uh, being more aggressive, actually, and less empathic, less... And by negative touch, you mean things like spanking or... Pinching, and... slapping. Yeah. Hmm. Right. So it's different than the lack of positive touch. So it's yeah. actual harm, feeling uh, uh-huh. feeling uh, negative um, pain, feeling pain. So... Yeah, long, longitudinal studies show it's not a good thing, and it shifts the trajectory of that child to be more self-centered because they're avoiding punished, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Then there's self-directed play, social play. That means the child can run around and jump and climb trees and wrestle and with others and be creative, especially in the natural world, ideally, and with multiple age playmates. It's not normal for us to be isolated with the same age or the same gender, by the way. Just as an aside while I'm thinking of it, I think every boardroom should have a baby in it because when men hold babies, their testosterone levels go down. Their their empathy then is the opposite. Uh, it will go up. I love that. It's every boardroom with a baby. <laughs> yeah, because otherwise testosterone keeps the rivalry between the males, keeps going up and up. That's why in, in tribal societies that go to war, they have to separate the men out for a few days before they go off to war because they, they have to raise their testosterone. Otherwise, they're in a multi-age, multi-gender um, living space all the time. So your testosterone never gets so high. Right. So play um, is developing all sorts of things that helps you develop your executive functions, your ability to stop and start actions, to have foresight, to be empathic towards your partner, your play partner, because if you don't, if you're not careful with how aggressive you are, they're going to stop playing with you. Right. So you have to learn all this flexibility when you play holistic, whole body play. And um, so I always recommend it for every age to heal ourselves, get back into playing that whole body play with a young child, and then you, you'll get more empathic, you'll get more flexible, you'll get more uh, a sense of pleasure in your being alive. Then there's uh, responsive relationships, which means that your uh, needs are getting met. And one of these things, it's not just um, psychological needs, it's also physiological needs. So in our ancestral context uh, the mother or someone else might be carrying a baby, but they'll put them down every now and then because they get tired of having them on this side. Well, they'll put the child on the ground. And the child then will move around on the ground with gravity and, and develop their neuro um, neurobiology of the whole body that way. And then when the baby's ready to p- be picked up again, the mother puts them on the other side of the caregiver. And so the baby also needs that responsiveness to their, the baby's need to be on the ground, to earth. We have have an earthing blanket in our household. If we can't go out and sit on the ground, uh, earthing blanket brings that energy from the earth into our bodies, which is relaxing and uh, takes care of pains. So what is, what is an earthing blanket? Yeah, it's, uh, you plug it in, you have to have the right kind of outlet that's grounded. You plug it in, it's bringing through silver threads, um, the energy of the ground to you, to your body. Oh, wow. I need to add this to my yeah, list. It's of very nice. Your birthday yes. present. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yep, yep. So then after, oh, responsive relationships then is multiple adult caregivers. So all this nestedness is not meant for just mom to do or mom and dad. It's a community. Yeah. It's a village, right? So in recent centuries, it's been the extended family. But in our ancestral context, 99% of our history, is it's uh, kin and non-kin. So it's a variety of people. And in, in the studies they've done looking at young babies and uh, who's taking care of them, 50% of the time or so, it's not the mother holding the child. So, but usually the mother's nearby. So if the mother's needed. But the child then is also allowed a lot of freedom. Once they're past that babyhood neediness, then they're ready to go off on their own and they're allowed to. They're, they Because the trust is in that child's inner compass again, that they are their own agent and they have their own purpose. And, and our ancestral folks um, 
also think that about other animals too. They're not going to manipulate animals because they have their own purpose and compass too. One of the anthropology friends I have told me about a study they did in the, with the Hadza in, uh, in Africa. And they were asking, doing the same kind of tests, I guess, questions to uh, around the world. And they have this set up about, oh, there's this frog in a tree. Uh, and there's, there, there's a pile of rocks. And I don't know all the, how much detail they give, but what are you going to do? And one of the answers was, is that an American frog? <laughs> African frog would never be in a tree. <laughs> and then another answer was, well, if the frog wants to be in the tree, well, who am I to say? Who am I to move the frog out of the tree? You know, so that, you know, it's just different worldview again, uh, that the whole world is full of agents. Everything's alive. Everything is moving. Everything is, is dynamically growing and evolving. And I'm a humble member of the community. We humans are just, you know, younger siblings. These yeah. other uh, life forms have been here for millions of years longer. We have a lot to learn from them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tyson Yunkaporta talks about how rocks are our eldest ancestors. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> they've been around for longer than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. so cool. Uh, then two more. One is nature immersion and nature connection. So as I've mentioned, we evolved to just be born into the natural world and not, you know, isolated in four walls with the microbes that are invading our bodies in a hospital and all that. Um, and uh, we need to have that immersion or to build that connection, that sense of, of being um, attached to caring for our partners. So for this tree, this river, this mountain, this rock, right? These, these are my partners, my, my community. And then the last one is uh, regular routine healing practices. In our ancestral context, uh, we can see that they have healing practices like every week. You know, the community comes together and they'll have dance, singing, dancing around the fire and trances. And the people who have healing capacities will just notice that someone needs their um, hands on and will heal them with um, tuning into the divine energies and uh, get them back centered. So help them with their mental imbalance or physical imbalance or relational imbalance. The San Bushmen, they of Central Africa, they have been around for 150,000 years, their culture at least, and they presumably house our um, genes for all of humanity. And they, when they're asked how often do they have a ceremony, oh, once a week. Um, but if there's grieving to do, maybe every day. <laughs> so I think we need to get back to grieving ceremonies. We have a lot of grieving to do in our modern yeah. world, so many things uh, that have gone off, or, off the rail and so much loss and damage. We have to get back tuned up because if you don't, if you don't uh, feel and release those feelings, you're going to, they're going to grab your heart and keep you from feeling in general, right? You have to release the, the grieving, the anger, the resentment, so you can get back into the flow of living. Thank you so much for taking us through all of that. So I guess the first question I'm I'm reflecting on my own uh, personal experience and the experience of my son, who is now five years old. So he, um, as I mentioned, we had a traumatic birth experience. We had to do an emergency C-section. He was born with a cleft lip and a cleft palate and so wasn't able to breastfeed. Um, he had two surgeries in his first year because of that. He got diagnosed with an eye condition and had another surgery. And so um, part of me uh, is, you know, as I hear you talk about these things, I'm like, oh, he didn't have all these things. And so what are, you know, perhaps what are some of the things that people can do if they didn't necessarily have the best start early on to help reduce some of that trauma? to help build more of that evolved nest. Yeah. Well, I always recommend Play. It's a great book called Play, Playful Parenting. And uh, it's about maintaining a positive attachment between the parent and child. And he has all sorts of suggestions, including 
when things kind of get off the rail, and this might be for older kids than a five-year-old, um, but to have a pillow fight and let the child be in charge, or even probably a five-year-old too, if they're mad at you, you know, have a pillow <laughs> fight and then fall over, let them hit you and you fall over, and then they're going to feel so much better. <laughs> We do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he loves it. He okay, loves it. Good, he, yeah. he loves the laughs a lot, giggles a lot when I fall to the floor. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that's good. A lot of that kind of play is really very healing and helps, you know, uh, the brain is pretty plastic in those early years to, to mold itself around, um, uh, to re repair itself in various ways. Yeah. So I think that's the best thing. And a lot of cuddling. And boys, again, need more of everything. So they need more of the playing and they need more of the cuddling. They need more responsiveness and tuning in and uh, freedom, uh, but also support. So um, depending on the age of the child, uh, you know, at early adolescence, I used to be a middle school teacher. Early adolescence is when the brain kind of revamps itself and and reorders itself. And so that's another sensitive time. You can move in with deep friendships and play and and um, experiences of the arts, for example. The arts are another thing you can do throughout life. Drama and drawing and dancing, those kinds of things are all healing because it's all right brain directed primarily. And then things that help the vagus nerve get set properly. So belly breathing and yoga and uh, meditation kinds of things um, that are and singing, being a, a singer and, and being in a choir or something, those are all things that help. Yeah, and we were lucky enough that we have a 100% outdoor Waldorf preschool Ooh. nearby. Ah. And so oh. for the last three years, yeah, he's been in an outdoor preschool. Oh, that's uh, perfect. Yes, I forgot to mention the nature immersion. Yeah, very important. Yeah. Yep. I mean, you know, we live in the D.C. area, so winters get get pretty cold here but they're outside you yeah. just make sure that they're geared up properly and yeah. and they get used to it and they love it mm -hmm. and the the school actually transitioned to 100 percent outdoor environment during the pandemic and it worked out so well and they have these beautifully outdoor you know very carefully curated sort of outdoor classroom spaces outside um but they, it worked out so well that they just decided to permanently keep the program oh, that's outside. That's great. Beautiful. It's like forest yeah. kindergartens. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's based on that philosophy uh, combined with the Waldorf method, which is okay. more sort of developmentally oriented, really sort of having instruction and academics and arts integration. All of that is very oriented towards sort of developmentally where the child is. And so... It's interesting because we've got a lot of friends, parents who are very much like, oh, you know, I, my, I want my five-year-old reading, you know, uh -huh. I'm reading by the time he's five. And a lot uh -huh. of our, and our public school curriculum has really pushed down academics even to kindergarten. And I just think that's fundamentally not the right approach. And so one of the things that and now I feel like I'm promoting Waldorf education. I don't intend to be doing that. But one of the things that Waldorf um, intentionally does is to say, let's let's developmentally follow the child. And so often you know, kids aren't reading until they're age seven, but it doesn't have a negative impact on them later in life or anything like that. In fact, it's often the opposite because I think of what you raised earlier, where there is more of that right brain development really early on because there is so much sensory play. There is so much... Um, nature immersion, there, there is so much gross motor, you know, just, just a play-based environment and more of like learning through tactile materials and, you know, forming beeswax into, into animals or whatever it might be that they're getting so much of that's not considered academic, but I just think it's such a critical, it's just so critical to establishing that foundation. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, Waldorf, uh, Montessori, uh, Reggio Emiliana, those are the schools that follow the child instead of imposing some adult idea of what they should be like, which reminds me of John Watson's uh, book. He was the president of American Psychological Association in the uh, early decades of the 20th century, and he wrote a book for parents in 1928. And 
<laughs> he knew nothing about child development, but he wanted to make sure that the children that p parents were raising would be good uh, college students in his classes. And they were just not good at the time. So he, he told them, <laughs> he told them, just pat them on the head once in a while, leave them in the crib, you know, shake their hand, your child, you know, and then get about your work, moms. <laughs> <laughs> but the reading thing, I mean, that is a problem. I, it's really undermining. It's shifting the brain, the child's brain development to left brain. The, the for most brains, uh, the left brain is where the language stuff is, and that you know separation from reality, which literacy does. You know, it keeps you uh, from being here and now. You're in some other world when you read, which is you know people say that's part of why we have wrecked the world too, because we've gotten used to detachment, which literacy does. So you don't want to do that too soon, and you want to do it when the child's ready. Uh, I think it's Paul Shepard that suggested, he was an ecologist, uh, very concerned about child development. He said that you really shouldn't read until you're 12, because it's those really? first 12 years you're doing the right brain stuff, and all, you know, you should be out there camping, and you should be, you know, learning how to uh, forage and and how to live well on your own and and develop all those skills first. Yeah, he also mm -hmm. recommended that adolescents, for those who have adolescents, um, have vision quests, right? And that's one thing that we've lost as well is that initiation right into being an adult. But it, it's really critical here because it's an initiation into finding your gift and being connected to the universe. Connecting to the universe will help you find your gift to give to the community, right? And we, we kind of just mess all that up, and, and the, the adolescents are ready to, you know, give a gift to the world. They're ready to be a hero in some fashion. And then yeah. nobody helps them do that until they find now on social media some rabbit hole. Of, you know, it's just a misdirected adolescent um, uh, move to adulthood. I'm going to keep that in mind, a vision quest for my son when he's, yeah. <laughs> when he's an adolescent. Um, in, your, in your book, you tell this beautiful story of two female elephants who were arguing with each other about who would become the new matriarch to lead the family. In the midst of this argument, a baby elephant gets accidentally knocked to the ground instantly. Both elephants stop, they're debating, and they run to help the baby. And you say the elephant's relational sense of self eschews any ego and overrides individualism. Yeah. Do you believe that humans are sort of born with this relational sense and that it's our it's our ways of being and our practices that sort of continue to build that ego or do you think we're sort of born with all of these elements and that they get out of balance depending on the ways that we live i'll take a third option and that oh, is great <laughs> <laughs> we're born prepared to learn all these ways of being with others uh and um colwyn trevarthen of university of edinburgh has shown that newborn babies are ready to have a social interaction already he has this video of a father holding the uh, newborn to his chest, skin to skin, and the baby starts grunting, and the father grunts back. And then the father gets distracted, and the baby goes, ah, <laughs> wait for the reaction. <laughs> hey, I'm here. <laughs> so that wow. social relational thing is ready, ready to be enhanced and grown and, and vitally focused on the particular culture's way of interacting, and we undermine it. So our uh, relational kind of non-individualism, uh, non our more communalism is part of us. The young children are ready to share. I mean, they share their food. They'll pick up the, in lab settings, they'll pick up the, the um, clothespin that the experimenter dropped, they figured out, you know, the, they have the child in the room and the experimenter's putting something up on, uh, with clothespins and the drops one and the young, you know, toddler will come over and give them the, so they're ready to be cooperators. And what we do and when we isolate them and punish them, especially the young two-year-olds who are, you know, they're all about running around and grabbing and doing and touching and feeling because they have this compass that says, learn, 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 learn. 
And if parents, you know, say, no, stop, spank you, stop doing that, pick them up and frustrate them, you are now planting seeds of self-denigration, of shutting down learning, of shutting down your intuitions, of shutting down, you know, being in the moment. So you want to always put those young children in situations where you don't frustrate them, where you don't have to say no, where they can do what they want because they're growing so well. And it's not spoiling them. It's the opposite. Because once they get through all this very fast learning, and they're ready to cooperate. They want to help. They want to fold the laundry when they're one. And you don't do it very well, but you let them do it because that seems to be a sensitive time to learn to be a community member. And if you wait until they're an adolescent, you say, take out the garbage. Uh, (laughs) It's too late. (laughs) It's not a sensitive period for that. (laughs) This is such a refreshing conversation because I think particularly for those of us who are, you know, potentially working in uh, social impact sectors or working on, you know, some of these big global crises like climate change or high risk or whatever it might be. There's there's so much conversation around, like, what do we do about these crises? And so much of the effort is on things that um, are important but there's not enough attention, I think, being paid to looking at what are what are the root causes of some of these issues that we're facing. And what if we were to do something different? What if we were to do something different in our child rearing practices that might ultimately, you know, cr- ultimately contribute to these larger worldview shifts? And I also love that what you're sharing here is that anybody and everybody can engage in these practices no matter you know whether you have children or you don't have children or no matter what age your child is that there are ways for all of us to be contributing that will help to really nourish the soil for this better world to to emerge and so i know we're getting close to the end of our time so my last question for you would be Who would you like to platform on this podcast? Four Arrows. Ah, yes. And and Gay Bradshaw, my co-authors, my recent co-authors. Ah, okay. Yeah. They both have a lot of wisdom to share. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, I would love a connection if you feel comfortable Uh making them. Yeah. Be brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darsha. This was such a wonderful conversation. As a mother, so much of what you said resonated deeply with me. And I know we have many parents in the audience, so I hope this conversation was valuable for them. Good. Thank you so much. Good. Yeah, you're welcome. And, and send people to evolvenest.org. And we have three little films there, six, eight, and 12 minutes long to help people, you know, reimagine our possibilities and a lot of tools. So nature connection tools. 28 Days of EcoAttachment.Dance. That was based on an experiment we did that worked, that was published. And uh, 28 Days of Self-Calming, if you need that. 28 Days of Solo Play, to learn how to play as an adult, for example. So we're trying to help people get back to feeling, actually uh, generating their own nestedness and then sharing it. Yeah. So thanks so much, Nigia. It's great. Thank you. I'll make sure we include all of those links in the show notes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. If you liked the episode and want to hear more conversations where we explore how a more beautiful world might emerge, subscribe or follow on your favorite podcast app or the Entangled World Pod YouTube channel. If you loved it, support the project at patreon.com forward slash entangled world. Thank you for listening and for coming on this journey together.